Like Repair of Reputations, our next story was not published in a magazine, but instead appeared in an anthology of short fiction published by the author. This short story, Future Story, was written by Leopoldo Enrique Garcia Alas Irueña, or Clarín, the pseudonym he went for, which means bugle in Spanish. Hmm. He was born in Zamora, which is about 15 miles away from the northeast portion of Portugal, to Astorian parents. And in 1863, he moved to Oviedo in Asturias, which is close to Spain's northern shoreline. And there he begins law school. In 1871, he moved to Madrid, and he worked as a journalist. And it's here where he adopts his pen name. In 1874, Arsenio Martinez Campos led a coup against the first Spanish Republic and restored the Bourbon monarchy to King Alfonso the Twelfth. So this event is going to play a major portion in the lives of this author, the next author we are covering, as well as another author later in the episode. In Madrid, Cladin was very much influenced by the philosophy of Carl Christian Frederick Krauss, a German philosopher who was largely obscure in most of continental Europe, but who experienced a vast increase of popularity in Restoration Spain. I'm not much of a philosophy person, so I'm not familiar with his works, but according to Wikipedia, his philosophy is that God is intuitively known by conscience, and it's not a personality, which implies limitations, but is an all-inclusive essence, which contains the universe within itself. So, in a way, kind of similar to a Hindu cosmological construction, where God is literally a part of everything, and that there's not really an individual soul, but everything is kind of an extension of the divine. So for whatever reason, this had a lot of people who were interested in this sort of thing in Restoration Spain. In addition to Krauss, Claudine was also influenced by the naturalist and realistic literature movements. He obtained his law degree in 1878, and his first short story, Pipa, was published in 1879. He taught in Zaragoza and Oviedo and published The Regent's Wife in 1884, which is largely considered to be his masterpiece. And in addition to this novel, he wrote a number of political and moral essays. And Future Story definitely fits in with this, even though it's a bit of fiction. Yeah. So Future Story was published in his anthology of The Lord and Other Stories in 1892. This story and the next story we're going to read were both translated by Leymar Garcia Sino, who is from the University of Liverpool. And they both appear in the, I guess it's a Spanish literary journal. The articles in this issue appear to be both in English and Spanish, so I'm not exactly sure what the audience is. It seems to be academic in nature anyway. The periodical yeah. publication name is Elite, which means helix in Spanish. This is the June 2013 issue, so if you're interested in reading this or the next story, that's where you would find them. Translated into English, anyway. The Spanish stories are freely available online uh, as public domain. And Clarine, Clarine does seem to be fairly known in Spanish literature, yes. yeah. unlike the next author. Uh, right. It seems much less so. But. Yeah, he was definitely a major figure in the late 19th century Spanish literary movement, which I'm really totally unfamiliar with before we did this episode, for whatever reason. I mean, I've been combing through used bookstores and thrift stores and flea markets and things like that for many, many, many years. And I don't think I've ever seen a Spanish novel from this time period there, despite the fact that I've seen tons and tons of French and Russian and some yeah. German stuff. Yeah. It just seems much less popular in the English-speaking world than some of those other authors, and I'm not entirely sure why at this point. Yeah, it's certainly out there. I mean, I have a friend from Spain that I've alluded to a couple of times on the podcast, and mm -hmm. he, he does talk about this stuff sometimes. And yeah. There's certainly a number of authors and a, a tradition, mostly pre-Franco. Yeah, of, absolutely. Yeah. 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 In particular, Claudine's masterpiece, or at least what people say is a masterpiece, The Regent's Wife gets compared to Flaubert's Madame Bovary, quite a bit. And oh. I like that novel, so maybe I like that one. But this story, future story, begins by quoting from a French book called Heliophobe, 
and it takes us many, many, many thousands of years into the future. Yeah, well, there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So already we're pretty far out. And this book, Heliophobe, is this weird philosophical musing on just being tired of orbiting the sun and going around and around and around endlessly doing all the same thing, like you're being locked into a system by some kind of tyrant. And apparently this was incredibly popular because Heliophobe sold 800 million copies and contributed to the growing cult of heliophobia. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like another dangerous book. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it definitely influences the scientific world. So all the leading scientists of the day are putting their efforts into how do we solve this problem of breaking free. Yeah, you would think free. they would be the last, the last people to be influenced yeah. by a book like this. <laughs> I'm but, sorry if I interject a bit. Oh, this, no, this, not at all. This story was really absurd to me. Like, Yeah, I, yeah. I don't even know how much I liked it, but it was very absurd. Yeah, especially yeah. the beginning because I didn't know where he was going with like any of this in, until the second half where it becomes obvious of you know what he's yeah. trying to set up here. But this beginning is very, very strange. And yeah, it's <laughs> it took me definitely a couple of times rereading some of the sentences to Yeah. It doesn't help that the translation is a little bit it's still been I in think. a little bit of places, but I think overall she did a pretty good job of translating the work and she even comments. I think she on did the... a good job of the next story, but I I feel like this one I don't know, something something was not quite coming across sometimes. Yeah. And yeah, like the, the way the sentences were structured. And right. Sometimes the wrong prepositions seem to be used almost. And yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah. conjunctions, I mean. Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to... I, <laughs> no, I no, it's brought fine. that up later. Yeah, but yeah. it was just... <laughs> you mentioned that having to reread sentences, and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what you have to do when the translation is a little bit iffy. Yeah. And, you know. And I mean, I of, definitely sympathize because, I mean, Holmberg was pretty tough break for me to cut through uh um, yeah no i'm not saying she did bad like, no no not you know, at all she did yeah. bad work or yeah. anything necessarily it's just uh yeah yeah and i mean cladine seems like one of those authors who are very clever and maybe cutting in his original tongue yeah and it might be difficult to bring that over in a way that has the same effect and impact into english and especially for a minor work like this uh, it might not be necessarily worth pouring over the minutia in a way that a novel like Crime and Punishment or, or something like that might right. have gotten a lot of attention from from translators for 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 whatever reason. Well, this certainly hasn't. This, this is the first English translation in an academic journal in 2013, right? Yeah, so, e exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely not on the same level. But the scientists of the far future are speculating on how we can push the Earth away from the sun and just have it kind of free fall into space and have everybody die. Cause you know, why not? <laughs> the yeah. kingdom of Spain is actively repressing this heliophobic movement, but is, and they're kind of supported by the church who praise what they call heliophilia saying that the world must end as the Bible ordains and not by some deep freeze spinning off into space. Yeah. And it starts to quote rather, frequently from the apocalyptic scenes of the Bible. But this religious sentiment is thoroughly mocked by all the public newspapers and cartoons. And somebody named Judas Adambus writes a column proposing that the sun should break yes, free from Yes, we should order. trust him. Yeah, right, of course. <laughs> yeah, trust in Judas. Yeah. <laughs> and his priest. Right, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, at this time, humanity has a vast knowledge of everything. And... They're very in tune with the psychological needs and developments and functions of humans. And they feel that life is kind of an abortion and that suicide is a common. And, you know, mass suicide is proposed by this Judas Adambas who works well with the governments to make this plan happen of killing everybody on the planet by throwing it out of orbit. Yeah. We get some backstory of what's happened to the rest of the world at the time, where England has been submerged by the sea, and the papacy in Rome is just really not comfortable with this idea of mass suicide. But it's passed by all the governments regardless, and as long as a minority exists that doesn't want to die, it would be murder, not suicide. So this raises an ethical dilemma that gets debated back and forth about 
you know, well, what do we do about this? And Judas Adambas quotes from Roman law saying that they must go through the decision because it's passed and the governments agree with him. And Judas harnesses some kind of novel force and rigs a mechanism to explode everyone on Earth with a touch of a butt. And it's yeah. been decided that the end of the world would be in this elegant ceremony in the highest dress possible at noon on New Year's Day. And they send out all these formal invitations and letters to everybody for the occasion. And Judas is joined by his wife, this woman, Avalina Apple. Oh, yeah. And she has that name. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there is this elaborate cuckoo clock there to sound the great moment where the world is to end. So yeah. the moment arrives, and indeed the button is pressed, and everybody explodes except for Judas and Avelina. And his wife was not in favor of mass suicide, but not for any moral reason, only to oppose her husband. And she pleaded for a way to make everybody live, but after the button is pressed, that doesn't happen. There's this huge mass of corpses everywhere blocking their path, making movement around the cities difficult. So they take a balloon to leave and they just kind of fly. Yeah, conveniently he has one in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Did they have that in the mummy? I know they had They balloons, had balloons. They yeah. were pocket balloons, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and during their balloon flight, Judas gives her this like food bar cigar type thing and he feels that he's a murderer with this now somehow weighing on his conscience after the fact but not before and yeah. he doesn't want to descend into the balloon while Evelina wants to eat the meals prepared for the Empress of Patagonia and just take advantage of everything that's left behind because nobody's going to be around to need it anymore but Judas's conscience has really been touched by God at this time and Evelina says, you know, he used to mock her for being a serious Catholic, and now at the end of the world, your conscience is coming into play? Like, what, what's wrong with you? But yeah. she is talking with him and proposes that they descend to where there'd be no remnants of civilization, no people left over to remind them of the previous world. And they try to scout out this location of the Garden of Eden. And they search for where it would be, and Judas theorizes it somewhere in Central Asia. And as they're scouting out this land, they see a man in white walking through a meadow. And it's, of course, Jehovah himself. So, ah. yeah. <laughs> Here, Clitorine interjects and breaks a fourth wall and talks directly to the reader on whether or not it's possible to see God in a human form. And he says, well, no, it's not. But he respects Jehovah. And to show respect, he's omitted naturalist tendencies of his writing he declines to go in any degree of physical detail and describing this figure but they descend in their balloon and crash into a tree frightening away all the birds judas is quite silent and solemn he wants to confess and repent and Evelina is only concerned about her thirst and her hunger so she wants something to drink and something to eat. but judas is more concerned about repopulating the world and jehovah tells him to see whether supreme malice is an advantage over supreme innocence and gives them the Garden of Eden and forbids them to touch one particular apple tree and says they know the biblical story of what will happen if they do. And he says there's hundreds of trees of the same kind of apple that they can eat from in this garden, but don't touch that particular one. Yeah. And sure enough, the exact same thing starts to happen. So a voice starts to tell Avelina that not only are these Valsane apples on the forbidden tree, but the rest of the apples in the orchard are counterfeit. And what's obviously the devil says more of this to her, and she gets in a fight with Judas about it, because he obviously doesn't want to eat the apple, because he knows what's going to happen. And she tells him to go away and fish some trout for her. And yeah. while she's alone, the devil tells her that an eternity of birthing awaits her if she doesn't eat the fruit. <laughs> which she obviously wants no part of, so she takes several of them off the tree, eats some. When Judas comes back, she tries to force-feed him the fruit, but he absolutely refuses. And then Jehovah comes by, angry, and they tell him 
everything that happened. And once again, humanity is exiled from the garden. And Judah says, well, wait, it shouldn't apply to me because he didn't actually eat the apple. It was only Avalina. So Jehovah's like, well, yeah, I guess you're right. So <laughs> he expels her and Judas gets to stay in paradise all by himself. And, Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> but eventually yeah. as the ages and decades and centuries and millennia pass, he gets so bored that he tries suicide, but it doesn't work. And he asks God to be taken up to the heavens and is eventually swept up. And therefore, humanity ends entirely. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> yeah. So it's this kind of commentary on the whole Adam and Eve thing and a retelling of it. And mm -hmm. the whole beginning of the heliophobe stuff is just really this elaborate setup to get to the point of what if we had an Adam and Eve again? Yeah. I, you know, like even uh, now that we just, we just finished describing it. I mean, I read all that and I don't think I missed anything, but I didn't enjoy it as much as talking about it now. <laughs> and I think no, I didn't just... either. I think this is one of the weakest stories, if not the weakest story of the bunch. It is like 10,000 words, so it's not terribly long, but it does feel longer. In some places, he really does go on with the biblical quoting and, and stuff like that. I think he really yeah. could have made this a lot punchier if, if he cut it down a lot. And but, I, I don't know if any of the humor is lost in translation, but it, it doesn't work as well as it sounds like it could on paper. Yeah, I mean, talking about it and the way we were able to, we're able to laugh about it, because yeah. it is pretty funny. Yeah, right. Makes the story sound pretty good, but for some reason, it in English at least, to me, it didn't work out as well as maybe it could have. Right. But there were things about it that I really liked. It took me a little while to get used to the beginning part like the whole it there was exactly, a lot of setup yeah. like you were saying yeah and I, I i really had no idea where he was going with this i'm like wait what <laughs> right but once it got to describing judas and his we had a character to sort of focus on and his scientific yeah. investigations into finding this force which are not really gone into but that whole thing with the you know sitting in the room with the cuckoo clock and the button yeah that was really modern. That made me think oh, of something. Absolutely. Out of, that was like something out of the fifties, right? Nineteen yeah. fifties. Yeah, I love that. That yeah. was really good. Like yeah. that was. It just seems so. Uh, it reminded me of almost like Doctor Strange Love level kind of just a bunch of guys sitting around a room holding the fate of the planet in their hands. Right. Exactly. For really the doomsday stupid machine. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. The doomsday <laughs> machine that which they have for a really dumb reason that most right. of the world probably <laughs> yeah. wouldn't even agree with. Right. It's just right. like. Some guy decided that they didn't want to orbit around the sun anymore because it was boring and everybody should just die. And for some reason, this idea has scientific primacy. Like, why? Yeah. I yeah. don't really the, know. The entire world is focused on this problem of ejecting the Earth from orbit. <laughs> yeah. And if we can't do that, we should kill the human race. Yeah. Just so, blow them all like, up. <laughs> it feels very much... Yeah, kill them all. It's yeah. very satirical. It feels very much like... The nuclear doomsday machine yeah. type of scenarios you would see so much in the 50s and 60s right and to me that that was amazingly ahead of its time mm -hmm. now once they met god i kind of yeah like i it, it wasn't i'm like okay i got it it's this biblical retelling parable kind of thing right and, and, and the translator like, does mention that he has a bit of a misogynistic streak in the writing and it does come out in the second half where it's very very transparent i mean his name is judas adam and his wife's name is Ava Apple. I mean, yeah, uh, Evelina Apple. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, uh, but uh, I mean, it was funny enough that the misogyny didn't really seem real. Like, yeah, yeah, it, it was funny enough. Like, like it felt like he was being absurd about it. Like, exactly. Yeah. At the end, Judas is just like, well, "What about me? I didn't do anything yeah. wrong." And <laughs> right. <laughs> like God says, "Oh yeah, okay, I guess so." Yeah. And, and <laughs> right. so like. We're supposed to feel happy for him in his eternal paradise of nothingness? No, yeah, I don't right. think so. Yeah. Right, like, <laughs> right. It's, it's, I, I, it was too absurd to be truly misogynistic. Like, right. I just felt it felt, and I, I do kind of appreciate the humor of it. I just, I think the religious angle didn't really feel. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe because we're so used to these modern stories of the Adam and Eve. Like especially after a nuclear thing, it's like played that out. is a it's common science fiction out. trope, yeah. and seeing it brought back so literally in that way, where it's like, 
very very literal about it they even meet god for fuck's yeah. sake right yeah, like right. <laughs> that is, it's almost too much like yeah. in retrospect after the last 150 years sure like i don't know i don't know but i did like that bit about the devil telling evelina like it is you know just saying hey you want to like give birth to stupid little humans for yeah, like right. hundreds and hundreds of years <laughs> And she's like, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> I, I like that. I yeah. that, that. That was good. And, and I realistic. Think, <laughs> yeah, Claudine had definitely issues with the church at the time. I mean, he was influenced by this whole Krauss philosophy, which really seems to break from mainstream Catholicism in a lot of ways. So I think a lot of this was poking at the contemporary church in some ways anyway. I don't really know too much of his other writings in the no. capacity that he wrote about religion and theology, but he was apparently a very, I, I guess, satirical and critical author in general. So I, It I, certainly comes across in this yeah, story. Yeah, definitely. The satire is very, very bold. Yeah. Even though I don't quite get all the, the references, maybe learning a little bit more about early 20th century Spain recently, but mm -hmm. even from looking up stuff about one of the authors that we're coming to a little later, Miguel de Ono Muno. Right, yeah. Other than that, yeah, it's all new to me, so... Yeah, so, yeah There likewise. are probably things that I missed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Clarín and Ono Muno were definitely huge figures in the late 19th century Spanish literary movement, but our next author doesn't seem to be so much. No, not at all, it seems. Yeah, so I think, uh, unless we have anything else, we'll take a quick break. And yeah, I don't really have a, a lot else to say about that, um, but I, I do feel more positively disposed to it than I did when I was reading it, yeah. oddly enough, <laughs> Yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. Well, some of these are, are fun to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And certain things stick in the memory, like that that cuckoo clock scene is, all, is yeah. great. It's cool. It's genuinely yeah. great. Yeah. So, yeah, that is future story. Mm -hmm. 